Rather than use a computer to control an Etch-a-Sketch, which I think is cheating, I thought I'd build an Etch-a-Sketch style input to control a computer. And I'm going to use these rotary encoders that I have left over from another project. I did think about using a stepper motor as the input device, because I really like the feel of this as a control. It's not difficult to use a stepper as a rotary encoder. It just outputs a couple of out-of-phase sine waves, which you could stick into an analog comparator. But their amplitude depends on velocity. So for very fine movements, I think this would give the illusion of a higher resolution than it actually is. Also, it's a bit of a waste of a stepper motor. So these encoders use a two-bit grey code, which is very simple. It actually goes through a complete cycle of the grey code in just one click of the revolution. And this gives you enough information to measure both direction and velocity from a single click. This here is all of the hardware that you need to build a USB device with an ATtiny85. Just three resistors and two Zener diodes. You could probably get away with just the one resistor actually. Um, the Zeners and the resistors here are just to drop the voltage to 3.3 from the 5 volts that USB provides. Uh, you're supposed to just use 3.3 for the data lines, but I can't actually imagine any computer being intolerant of 5 volts on the data. But it's best to be on the safe side. So if we're using two pins to run the USB, that leaves us only three pins to read our encoders. And each encoder has the two-bit grey code and also has a button. Well, I suppose we could switch to a bigger chip. Um, but that would require waiting for delivery, and this is a pretty spontaneous project. We could add another chip, like an ATtiny13, which would read the encoders and then, say, transmit it via serial. Uh, but that sounds like a lot of work. Or we could use a clever arrangement of resistors to turn the state of the encoder into an analogue voltage, which would only use up a single pin. This is a pretty common technique, which I've used before for building keypads, but there you're generally not bothered about pressing two keys at once. So if we think of our encoder as two switches which short the centre pin to the outer pins, we could put a pull down on the centre pin and two different pull ups on the other pins. And this would give us a voltage something like that. I mean, this would work, uh, but I was a little concerned about how close together these voltages would be. We want to be able to read this quickly and accurately. So my next idea was to make two rungs from an R2R ladder DAC. But this still won't give us totally linear steps, because this is intended to work with pins that go from high to low, whereas we're going from high to open. If we played with it some more we might be able to get it better, but the smallest step is now about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts, so that should be fine. circuit is now soldered together, I stuck the zeners and the resistors inside the plug, just because it was easy enough to do. 
As for the case, well, we have a laser cutter, so it could be anything we like, but I went for a rectangle. I know a lot of people don't like this point-to-point -point wiring, but uh, I don't think a piece of protoboard would really have made it any tidier or easier to see what's going on. In each corner we have the R2R ladder, slightly squashed. Uh, slight change of plan for the buttons. I'd totally forgotten that the third analogue channel that we can use is on PB2, which is absolutely needed for the USB, because it's the uh, int zero pin. But we can also use the analog input on the reset pin, and we can do that actually without having to disable the reset, so long as the analog input is above the logic level of low, so anything above basically 2.5 volts. So I rewired that to be pulled up, and then each button slightly pulls it down uh, within the range of 5 to 2.5, and that works fine, and that means we can still reprogram it in the normal way. By the way, if you don't have one of these IC test clips, then get yourself one and connect it to a USB programmer. Then you can just clip it straight on and reprogram as needed, clip it off again. Much easier than fitting a ISP connector or socketing the chip or anything like that. So I'm going to use the VUSB library from Objective Development, which, once you get it to compile, is very easy to use. The most important thing here is that we don't want it to depend on drivers or software or what operating system you're using, we just want it to plug in and be a mouse, which is a little more difficult than plain USB. We need to tell the host that we're a human interface device and give it this report descriptor to say that we're going to be sending mouse coordinates and mouse buttons, these report descriptors have a pretty dense format, but luckily one of the example files from Objective Development is for a mouse, where they've included the report descriptor and hardware and vendor IDs from a Logitech mouse. So obviously we couldn't sell this, but uh, who cares? As far as the computer's concerned, a mouse is a mouse. I've also included the calibration code. Here it is. The calibration code from the EasyLogger example project which uses USB measure frame length to tune the internal oscillator to 16.5 megahertz. So the first thing I created, just to test it out, was this. Probably the most annoying USB device in existence. Although I guess there's some pretty stiff competition. It continuously sends the same report, which means that your mouse will just always be drifting slightly to the right. OK, we've got our encoders working. It seemed fairly obvious to make one rotational click correspond to one pixel, but that does make travelling any distance across the screen a real chore. So I made it proportional to velocity, like a real mouse. This makes operating a computer much easier, but if we want to use it to control a drawing programme, it does feel a little disconnected, because the pointer position is no longer directly proportional to the wheel position. But after a few minutes, I have gotten used to it. I limited the top speed to, I think, 16 pixels per click. So it's fairly easy to judge how far it will go at top speed and at slowest speed. So the buttons at the moment are just sending their current state, which means you have to hold the button down in order to draw. Right mouse button works as well. And there aren't many applications which require you to press both mouse buttons at once, but in MS Paint it serves to cancel the line you're currently drawing. But to have it feel more like an Etch-a-Sketch, I thought it'd be better to have the buttons toggle the mouse click on and off. Toggle mode is enabled by plugging in the USB while holding down one of the mouse buttons. Now it's Press once to enable mouse down. Press once to release. OK, 
can even hold them both down if you want. I used an interesting bit of bitwise logic to do the toggling. State is a bit mask of the current buttons held. Exclusive all between the previous state and the current state gives us the buttons that have changed, and that with the current held buttons gives us the buttons that have been pressed, and then exclusive all, all that with the report buffer to toggle them. This shed light on one last problem, which was the capacitance of the reset pin. When you release the right mouse button, it would sometimes detect a momentary press of the left as the voltage returned to high. So in toggle mode, that would lead to an erroneous toggle. The fastest and easiest way to debounce that is to just lower the sample rate. USB pole is running at about every 30 microseconds, so toggle weight should wrap uh, every 7 or 8 milliseconds. Well, that was entertaining and edifying, hopefully. Of course, this whole thing was completely pointless because we could have just taken apart a ball mouse and stuck knobs on the encoders it uses. But in that situation, we wouldn't be able to brag about building USB devices from scratch.